but I think we should be looking at affective playlists. Like, what song do you have, Lindsay, that makes you feel strong when you're vulnerable? Hmm. That's a good question. I think of I think we should have- This Girl is on Fire. Do you know that song? I do. Yeah, that was one I listened to. I think that we have a tendency probably to say, I'm sad, I'm going to listen to sad music and just kind of then sink into that, but not to think of what, how, that you can actually help yourself out of it consciously um, and embracing where you're at, but then knowing that you're going to transition out of that. That is you're such just, a good you're idea. You're nudging the needle. You know, you're just nudging that needle from sad to dark. Welcome to the Gentle Finds podcast. I'm so happy to introduce you today to Dr. Kathleen Howland, who is a board certified music therapist and licensed speech language pathologist. For the past 35 plus years, she's worked with a variety of clinical populations using music to enhance speech, language, cognition, and movement. She teaches courses at Berkeley School of Music and the Boston Conservatory at Berkeley, and she's developed a specialization in neuroscience as the biological rationale for why music is effective and necessary in educational and medical settings. She's presented keynote lectures and workshops nationally and internationally, specializing in physician and nursing education, and you may have seen her TEDx talk, How Music Can Heal Our Brain and Heart. Hi, Kathleen. How are you? I'm very well, Lindsay. So glad to be with you. So happy to have you here. So let's start with, uh, you've been in the field of music therapy for almost 40 years. Have you witnessed a sort of arc of awakening about music therapy and appreciation for it? I love that phrase, arc of awakening. (laughs) Absolutely. It is, uh, particularly in the last five years, has been at a breathtaking rate. So 40 years ago, it really was a very strange response, like, what, what is music therapy, you know? And right. we would have to begin our advocacy, and I liken it to a beautiful analogy of spitballs, steamships, and stadiums, where we, in order to change public opinion, which is like a steamship, it takes tremendous energy tremendous focus to get a steamship to turn around distance and energy. So each one of those conversations was like a spitball Mm. in the effort to turn the, that ship around Um, to the point that there's a stadium full of people that are cheering this on. It was um, a spit spitballs that were not very effective because they're spitballs. It's one conversation. But now it's reached a tipping point, and within the last five years, there have been more gains made than in the previous 35. Excellent. In my estimation. So for me, it's breathtaking. And when I say I'm a music therapist, people want to say, oh, let me tell you about what happened when my grandmother was dying. The music therapist came in, and she finally let go. Or, wow. You know, so people have orientation and are certainly more anxious to drill deeper. Mm-hmm. And I find that thrilling so glad I lived long enough to see it happen. Yeah. You know, music is one of those things. I think there's not a person on earth that doesn't have a musical memory. Well, there are are 1.5% of people who don't have musical memories because they don't process sound as music. Oh, okay. They find it annoying. They find it caustic. But yes, that means 98.5% of the entire human population really has access to music to perceive it and to produce it. And what is music therapy? We all know what music is, but what is music therapy and why is it so healing? Well, music is processed in the brain in a way that's very unique from any other human skills. It involves the entire brain in perceiving and in producing music. Because it has no specialized center, it's interwoven with all other non-musical skills. And we can use the music to leverage those non-musical skills like speech and language, movement, emotions, and cognition. And it's very powerful. The ears are always on. So you can work with somebody who's in a state of unconsciousness and facilitate their arousal so that they can rejoin 
you know, the stream of their life. They can move on from a post-surgical arena to uh, subacute care or whatever it is. We can reach them. We can understand that they deserve treatment because they are reacting. Um, and music is really the finest of assessment tools in that regard. The ears are always on. You can shut your eyes, but you cannot shut your ears. Wow. Yeah, I never thought of it that way. And I didn't even realize, you know, I've heard of people being in comas um, and saying that they've maybe heard something. But yeah, I didn't realize that. And in one of your blog posts, I think, or maybe it was your TED Talk, you said, when you see me walk into a hospital with a guitar on my back, don't assume I'm here to entertain because it's, it's more it's, than that. Who is music therapy for? Because it, it sounds like it, it could be for hospitals, um, but also for the rest of us. Absolutely. I think it would be a far shorter conversation to say, who is music therapy not for? Which would be those 1.5% of people who are identified as amusic. Um, but when you look at educational settings, children with autism, children with intellectual deficits, children with ADD, and you look at medical settings, that would be from womb to tomb. For those outside of both of those settings, it's it's you and I who are looking to run the inner peace circuitry of our brains. For many, meditation is the way to do that. Mm -hmm. For many, mindfulness, Tai Chi is. But for many, many, particularly in acute places of stress and anxiety, music is the way to run that. And by doing so, you intentionally run the circuitry that is the opposite of the stress response. And it emboldens and in, in, in invigorates a relaxation response. And that is really key to well living. Uh, can I, I have a quote from your blog about stress, actually. And I'd love to just read it because I think that it, it's perfect. So you say, here's a startling headline. If stress was a virus or bacteria, it would easily be classified as a pandemic. Far more powerful than the coronavirus, SARS, H1N1, and flu, it kills us locally and globally. Stress results in a myriad of diseases and disorders, so its mask is always changing. But the truth remains the same. Stress is killing us. And so, yeah, music somehow heals us from that stress. And we need it on a level that probably we don't acknowledge or understand um goes back to he how we've evolved as humans and you even also say that you think that it uh, contributed to our success as a species possibly because we see it in in as far back as we can trace human history essentially yes i feel very very strongly about this that uh, when we look at what it took to survive it was always identified as food and shelter and and clothing and that would have been so because of the ice age uh, under which our early predecessors evolved and were making flutes 40,000 years yeah. ago. Um, they were making bone flutes. And so if you were in the cave, and I love to imagine this, I love to think about what were they doing in the caves, and I, I can't wait to go visit those caves. Um, but, you know, somebody's making this flute, this thing that had no predecessor, no precedent, um, and they, they make a sound and a baby in the cave goes, oh, and they make the connection. And then you're down the way at a different cave from where the flutes are, but you hear the flutes, you're leaving your people and you're going to where the music is. Cause that's what we always mm -hmm. do. You go down to where the music is. And therefore there was all this bonding and there's beautiful work by a researcher named Daisy Fanport in and she uh, penned a report for the World Health Organization, um, as well as many other reports on how music uh, facilitates bonding and how you see that when you study adult choirs. Yes. And, and that's exactly the antidote to this pandemic of social isolation is to bring people back in to a healthy form of, of creating oxytocin through this bonding experience in music. I feel certain uh, in my intuition and into my intellect that that's why Homo sapiens survived mm -hmm. is because they had this. They were also doing sculptures at the same time. Interesting. Wonderful creative sculptures. 
and and I think that um, sound it was really critically important. The caves had a part in making the flutes sound far better than they were. These ready little bones. Oh yeah. Flutes, um, that helped, but the echo helped soften that, and people started to react and come together. And that's where we really were able to pick up some steam beyond just surviving. We were able to thrive. Yeah. And so there's an aspect to music where it's not only healing and fostering a sense of community and bonding, but also it develops us. So in terms of education, uh, there's, there's so much going on in our brain. And I found it so interesting that there's a piece you say, there's no um, music center in the brain which never occurred to me actually. And I studied music, uh, but that it's lighting up all parts of our brain. And that's an argument for why it's so critical for children to have that and have exposure to that and all of us to have exposure to that. I think that is the work I never saw coming down the pipeline through research. That if um, I just recently read this, this gorgeous researcher in Germany um, who's uh, taking the recordings of children cooing at five, six months of age and natural cooing and just taking those recordings. And what they find is that if the corpus of recordings isn't diverse, that that will predict a language delay at two or three years of age because they're, they're not producing, they're not perceiving. So they're not producing, they're not perceiving sound in a healthy way. And furthermore, if you're three years of age and a, a set of patterns was played for you, whether it's rhythmic or melodic, like D D D D D D D D D D D D, and a child says those are the same, at three years of age, that will predict the likelihood of dyslexia. And with dyslexia, it's very, very difficult to treat. It's a very difficult disorder to treat. Plus, you have to be at least two years behind grading age to uh, get services, to get identified. And then you're a fifth grader reading at a third grade level. Things take off in sixth grade. You get further and further behind. Um, and so the ability to look at how normal auditory perception wires the brain for language and literacy later is really implicit in how any family with a child with um, a genetic predisposition for dyslexia should have their children in early childhood music programs. Um, anybody with the same thing with language delays, but also making sure that children grow up in rich musical homes, not just having the radio yeah. on, not just that. But if every child is educated in music education to be a later parent, who can create little play songs, create a familial lullaby, like a cultural lullaby. Yeah. This is my gift to you, my child. These are my wishes for you. These are simple compositional styles, and they should be taught at, at a middle school level and then continued. You would have middle school children who are babysitters of the day, mm -hmm. empowered to use the music to regulate the children that they serve, and later to be able to use that as a that, to me, is the raison d'etre of music education. Yeah. Whether you go to Berkeley or not uh, is not the point, nor is it the point for you to study math and go to MIT. Mm -hmm. The point is that you learn to develop these inherited human rights. To yes. To be solved, to be self-expressed. Yes. They are. It it's a fundamental part of what makes us human. And this whole thing has gotten me thinking about, um, you know, as a new parent, I have a three-year-old now, and we talk a lot about how the way we're raising kids right now is unnatural because we're extracted from our village, the indigenous sort of lifestyle that we had developed to create our societies for so long. Mothers are alone. We're isolated, especially now. 
But music is another one of those things. And I see people come alive with music. You see children come alive as soon as you start singing to them a lullaby or anything. Uh, you see it working on their emotions and the bonding. And my daughter, she wants to dance all of the time. She wants to sing. And it it's sad that we don't give it any place anymore because we all are moved by it yeah I feel like music is another one of those things that it's so a part of us we all have this heart and mind connection to it uh, and so it's surprising that it's not a part of our daily lives we're not including it as a part of our educational system everywhere um, for everyone it's kind of amazing we just have radio right and I think one of the things that you made a beautiful point of is how attentive children are to music. And so music is really key at getting people's attention, whether it's from the folks down the way in a cave without music and they're attending to it and then going to it, or a person who's in a coma or yeah. a child. And attention is the bedrock of all cognition. Nothing happens until we pay attention. Right not language processing, not memory, not higher order thinking. And so when you get attention, and music is a temporal art form, it is time-based, so that you can extend somebody's attentiveness mm -hmm. by using music, and therefore that helps shape the listening brain. And that's why it's so magical with children. Mm -hmm. Like I, I have oh, 500 gigs of films on my computer, and I love them, especially children who are sound asleep and they play their favorite music. You watch the bodies start to wake, to, to start moving to the music, and then the child wakes up. It's oh, fantastic. Wow. So it grabs their attention even when they're asleep. And that's because the ears are always on. Wow. Wow. We're always listening. We're always listening. And that, you know, that's to... obviously key for our safety because you need to listen for aberrant sounds or sounds of significance. And those sounds right. of significance can be music that you want. I, thinking about education and bonding, I've, I have to make a little personal um, a plug here for a school that I went to when I was younger because it had such an impact on me and others. Um, I was lucky enough in middle school uh, to go to the Crowden School in Berkeley, California. My parents found it, and at the time, I'm going to age myself, but it was the early 90s, and um, Ann Crowden was still the head of the school. It was tiny. There were about 30 kids, and from 5th to 8th grade, uh, and the magic of it was that for every morning for two hours, we would all come together and play music. Every one of us played an instrument that was that was necessary to be a part of the school. And we would play music for two hours with kids who we otherwise might not have chosen to do anything with uh, or share anything with, you know. We might not have found any commonality. So I speak to my friends uh, who went to the school with me now today, and we all agree it was one of, if not the best educational experience we had. And it was because of the magic that that music brought to our daily lives and the magic of uh, that focus that it had. So like you say, it, it wakes us up to a kind of focus music does. So it was a perfect way to start the morning. It was simultaneously a way for us to find shared focus and playfulness. And... All of those elements together, I think I, I couldn't have asked for more. And I wish that for every child, really, because it allowed us a freedom of expression at a time in our lives when most kids are dealing with growing pains and social anxieties um, and social exclusion issues. And so it gave us a sense of togetherness that I think a lot of the kids wouldn't have had otherwise. Uh, and so just it absolutely convinced me of the magic of music and absolutely convinced me that every one of us needs it. If so, you look at those that are most yeah. vulnerable in a school system, those would be the children with special needs, the ones that are different and weird, you know, as 
children start to make those distinctions. There are three places that are yeah. generally considered for mainstreaming. So in the U.S., children um, by law need to be mainstreamed in the least restrictive environments. Typically what that means is recess, lunch, and music. Now, lunch, of course, is an absolute nightmare for people, and it's easy to be isolated in the lunchroom. It's very easy to be isolated in mm. the uh, in recess, to not be included, to not, you know, have the the courage to go out and ask to play with somebody. But in the music room, everybody has a place. And what you personified in that gorgeous description of the school is that there is a place for everybody in the music room. It is the only place in a school system that yeah. casts an inclusive net. So you've got children. That's it. Yeah. With ADD, with dyslexia, who struggle everywhere else who do well there, who may have mental health issues, who um, are athletes, who are the A students. All of them are together in one room, doing something magnificent together, making one incredibly gorgeous sound together, or one less gorgeous, less than gorgeous sound, and working toward gorgeous. Everybody has their place. Um, and it fosters leadership in remarkable ways. So when I was 16, I uh, was elevated to the first chair position. Um, and it came at the expense of a senior who was in that role. And I was taking a lot of heat from uh, the peers. Yeah. And, you know, why couldn't I just let her be, et cetera, et cetera. It was a blind audition. Um, and my music teacher wisely had nothing to say about any of that, but this is what he had to say to me. Now that you're in the, in this position, who will you be to the last person in your section? Will you be helpful or will you be better than? And if you're 16, mm. you would never think to ask the question, but you knew the answer. You were going to be helpful. And so I started by working with that person, playing duets with them, asking them to play duets staying after school with them to do to practice the, the music and there I learned to to be inclusive there I learned to be loving and compassionate and helpful wanting that better than would be to lift them Difference, I serve on the school committee in my neighborhood because of many yeah. issues one um, where I see the, the look of of athletics versus music. Yes, there are opportunities under the right guidance, under the right coach, to also lift up that person who's last in your group um, or was last to be chosen. But what I, in the long view, what I see is music is the gift for life. Athletics is not, per se. Um, when I go back mm -hmm. to high school reunions, the, the young men that I knew that had been the athletes at the time are not in great physical shape at 60. Um, they, and certainly, even if they were in great physical shape, they're certainly not able to play football or basketball at probably 40, at 50, at 60. Um, but music, there's no reason why you cannot play music for the rest of your life. If you have arthritis, you may be constrained. But if you have dementia, you can still play music. If you have Parkinson's disease. Yeah, that's incredible. Music. And I have worked in hospice and palliative care and been with people at the last moments of their life and music was still relevant. It filled the empty void wow. of that room with love and aesthetic beauty. And it helped everybody who was just waiting for that next breath, that next breath, to be connected, to see the shoulders connected, to see the, um, the place that music can have. Yeah. Music is the gift for life. So in looking at athletics versus music, in our community, there's fundraising of $200,000 to $250,000 a year for athletics in six to nine for the music programs. That's something I hope will be more active in our nation. Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, oh, and so through your work, uh, you've developed a specialization in neuroscience as the biological rationale for why music is effective and necessary. Could you tell me a little bit about 
that, the, the neuroscience side of sure, it? Sure, I think it hails back to being on an elevator with the guitar on my back and knowing that I'm not there just to entertain <laughs> people because nobody's going to pay us to make people happy. We just don't care enough about people's happiness who are struggling in the hospital. The yeah. happiness we create is a happy byproduct. We will be paid and reimbursed if we can make them walk more effectively after a stroke, if we can help them speak better with Parkinson's disease, if we can help an autistic child begin to use language. Um, those are things that people will pay for. So it began for me in the middle 80s when I was working in a state institution with people who were very, very medically compromised. It was the infirmary unit. And what I saw was this one woman who knew 300 or so different songs. I couldn't believe the library of songs that she knew. And she would cry to John Denver's music. Then there was this other woman who was 30 years old who I taught to walk for the first time in her life to David Bowie's music. And I had all these experiences wow. that I couldn't understand because they were all severely and profoundly intellectually disabled and medically compromised. I couldn't understand mm. why in on the floors or in their classroom, it was this long list of can't, can't talk, can't walk, can't express basic wants and needs. It was, it was a long list, but then I'd go into my studio and their humanity, their ability to trust, to be, to experience love and to be loving and music were all intact. And then I would like, walk them outside my door and say, how could this be? At the time, Howard Gardner's theories of multiple intelligences was just being published. And that made sense to me. Okay, they don't have verbal and math intelligences, but they have interpersonal and they have musical intelligences. Okay, but how, how can that coexist in a brain that's so very damaged? Um, and so that was what started my pursuit. And of course, there was nothing at the time. Um, and in those days, we worked on goals that were from psychology, like self-expression. And, um, you know, so we were looking at biological outcomes, the ability to walk, the ability to stand. But we weren't looking at the biological process. So for a long time, at least 15 years, it was a small trickle. And each study was a like a triumph, you know, and I would saturate. I bet, it. yeah. And now I can hardly <laughs> keep up. They are coming from all over the world. And there's a wonderful conference in June. It will be in Aarhus, uh, Denmark. Unfortunately, uh, it's not yet time to travel there. I'll be watching by Zoom. But mm. that's where the latest and greatest will be happening. It only happens every three years. And now this is year four because of last year. Um, oh. And I can't wait to see where it's going and who the players are. There are teams in Finland and in Britain that I greatly admire. I got an um, article the other day from Tunisia. I had to go to the Atlas and make sure I knew where Tunisia was. Yeah. It's wonderful. And now that NIH that is. is involved, it's it's a skyrocket. It's just absolutely stellar. Can you tell me a little bit about your experience with hospitals and I, I saw that you had created um was it clinical protocols for people who are going to be put under anesthesia and things like that i have i have created that clinically i've not been able to do that in research berkeley is not uh, a research institution so i would cherish the opportunity to bring that into um, study because i think that it parallels the relaxation response by herbert benson which is an institute at Mass General Hospital that's been studying the stress response. Well, it's been studying the relaxation response since the 1970s, which is the binary opposite of the stress response. And I think the catalyst through music is far more immediate. So if you have just been diagnosed with cancer, as a friend of mine is right now, finding out what the treatment is, that's a lousy time to try to learn to meditate or to do mindfulness or Tai Chi. Yeah. That's when they That's give you point. out of bed like candy. Um, and yet if you bring music on board, that's a tool for resilience that can pierce the 
um, the high anxiety that comes with that kind of a diagnosis um, with immediacy. So if for somebody going into surgery, we can move into that space and bring down their vital signs so that the all of the steroids aren't being pumped into the system in the stress response and you won't need uh, and that upregulates the body and you won't need all of that anesthesia to overcome that you won't need all hmm. the anesthesia to overcome the steroids the high blood pressure the high heart rate because you're laying down but you're in a stress response because that's the way we were built well over 40,000 years ago Mm. Um, and so what we see is we have these ancient brains that are have not evolved to deal with modern life. And so we either yeah. run in the stress response or run in the relaxation response. And music is a very strong trigger into the relaxation response without any practicing needed. They mm. need a music education to have an appreciation. That is very that's very important so that music continues to be salient in their life and it's not expunged um, in childhood because if it's not used, then it becomes weak, weaker and weaker. And that's mm -hmm. what will make me sad until the last days of my life is children who don't have a music education. Yeah. It seems like it's almost as close as you can get to someone holding your hand in a surgery um, environment because it does, it connects us to memories of people we love. And we have to be careful with those memories too, because they may be too emotional for a time of high stress. Mm -hmm. We as music therapists have to have a scalpel really, where we distinguish what is really um, emotional and get the right mm -hmm. emotion for the right outcome. So, so a, a good example. Go ahead, go ahead. I was going to say, a good example of that is um, for preparing my mother for surgery. Um, I knew that she loved um, Schubert's Ave Maria, and it's very sedative. And it would meet all the requirements that I would have of music to trigger the relaxation response, except the emotional part. Here in New England, it's used at both funerals and weddings. Right. So it's laden with memories and it always reminds her of her sister who she lost. So mm -hmm. thankfully, uh, I would eliminate that piece by Schubert, but he wrote so many other pieces with the same uh, musical elements to be sedative, to be identified as sedative, and that's what I would use. And so the hospitals let you how far into these environments are you with someone in a room pre-surgery yes or preparing them at home to go into surgery so they are empowered our therapy only matters when there's carryover when they're better because of us but not always we're not always walking with them to help them walk I better see. we're not always yeah. there so uh, by practicing the relaxation response to music before they go into surgery, they have a game plan. If you don't have a game plan, the body just goes into its default setting of stress response. But mm -hmm. if you're working with that person and they stay under their headphones and they're walking into the hospital saying, yes, I'm staying in my bubble. I'm seeing people being very busy, walking very quickly, but I am in my bubble of well-being and I'm listening to this music, and they maintain that relaxation response. Also, the music can be used afterwards to reintegrate them, to uh, arouse them back into um, consciousness so that they can follow directions from the nurses or if a physical therapist is coming in, that they can transfer safely from sit to stand or wherever they need to, that they're not... Um, there's a lot of delirium from anesthesia, particularly with elders. And therefore, you could, you know, they could perhaps have a fall or something, which would obviously be devastating. So bringing them back into consciousness, knowing they are back fully online and that they can follow directions safely means that they go into the next setting, whether it's a floor room or a subacute or rehab. Those are the cheaper settings. And they're not maintained in the more expensive post-surgical, where they're not mm. well equipped to be dealing with people who are trying to get out of bed and um, that sort of thing, that you can get them back 
online, bring them up out of anesthesia. They may not have needed as much anesthesia to go under because they were already relaxed. And then they come back up um, out of anesthesia much more efficiently. And do you have interviews with these people to get to know what music would be safe for them? Yeah, absolutely. It's an assessment. Um, so for the protocol I developed, it's it's two parts. One is the assessment and one is the treatment. And then they're independent from there. So the mm. assessment is very, very much not only what you like, but what you don't like. What, mm -hmm. what your relationship is to music. Because what I'm looking to find is music that they don't know, that they will love, that I can use clinically. And mm -hmm. so um, I have a thorough assessment that does that because I need a clean pal palette on which to work. Something that they will have an affinity for, but they don't have any prior associations um, because that mm. can be uh, absolutely contraindicated. So it's threading, again, a needle. It's, it's that scalpel efficiency. And that's why music therapists have over 1,200 clinical hours of training in order to be able to do that. Um, mm -hmm. it's not just a musician sitting in a hallway somewhere creating beauty. Um, it's beauty with purpose. It's beauty mm -hmm. with a biological rationale. And, and what we get is beauty as a happy outcome. It's a nice side effect. Yeah, that's wonderful. And so you had your own personal experience. Was this before? Where, where did your own personal experience, because you actually were someone who went through a cancer scare and had to do your own music therapy on yourself. Was this, where did that fit into your journey with music therapy and all of the, these discoveries? Did it uh, launch those discoveries or did you know about them already? I had already been working the protocol for quite a number of years and I was working in oncology um, there is a place called the Healing Garden in Harvard, Massachusetts, which is for breast cancer patients and their families. And I had been working there um, and also doing outsourcing training with nurses. Um, but that was a place of tremendous support and, and distinctions for me about oncology. And then I became a patient and a client um, later when I was diagnosed about 10 years ago. Um, so I had distinctions that there was no way I was going to watch Jerry Springer and receive chemotherapy. Like I worked in a hospital that the Healing Garden outsourced a program that they took to like a duck to water. Um, and eventually the nurses put signs on all the TVs to say they didn't work because they didn't want people spending their time doing this. They, we had created these music and art programs and they wanted, um, there are people involved with that. So I knew what I didn't want to have happen. And I knew that um, I was going to have 15 months of chemotherapy. Um, infusions are eight hours for a day. I wow. was working as an adjunct professor. And so I, I couldn't give up my work or take a break because I was paying insurance out of pocket. My so God. I knew that, yeah, it was, it was very, very physically challenging. And so I said there was no way I was going to be grading papers, getting infused with these very toxic drugs, um, that I wanted that eight hours to be filled with joy and aesthetic beauty and laughter. So yeah. I would carry this curtain of all this stuff and I'd watch an opera in like three and a half hour opera. And I still had, you know, four and a half hours to go. I had a plethora oh, of God. time that I wouldn't yeah. have been granted. So how will you fill that time? Um, and it was never gonna be the TV. I made music, I laughed, I watched funny things. I didn't read, it didn't call to me, but it, it deepened my appreciation for um, the very great challenge of cancer, whether it's stage one or stage four, just the C yeah. word puts us all into a difficult place. And um, I will say that my oncologist watched the way that I managed myself and then had me do physician grand rounds when I was on the other side. 
um, and this year is the state president for the Mass Oncology Association, and it will be a very musical one indeed, because we, That's I was awesome. there so long that we, yes, we garden together, we dine together, and we will be doing this together, and it was her great appreciation for the music therapy that that I brought in, that, that I was doing, and my friends all coming in and making music with me. Mm. And do you have any particular stories? You must have seen so much in your career and spoken to other colleagues who have seen so much. Do you have any that you'd like to share or one in particular? Gosh, there's so many that I've written a book of them. Um, there's always this, this one that stands out to me, and, and I'll never remember their names or where they lived, but I'll never forget the experience. Um, I was in hospice work, um, and I had received a referral from a nurse to see a man, and when I called, the phone got to like six or seven rings. Um, and then this wife got onto the phone frantic. Hello, 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 hello. Just, I mean, I can, it, it makes me shiver still. And she, uh, I said, you know, I was Kathleen, I'm the music therapist and the nurse had asked if I could uh, come by and I'd like to see if I could. And again, frantically saying, well, I don't, I, it's not a good time. It's not a good time. I think he's going to die. I said, are you alone? And she said, yes, 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 I'm alone. And so um, there was this, we talked a little bit, and then there was this long pause, and she said, well, what would you do if you came? And I said, I'd fill the empty void with love and music. I don't even know where wow. I got that phrase from. And then she finally said, come on. And as it turned out, the social worker just the day before was challenging her to accept help. And I think that's where she paused and thought, Hey, maybe where I should think where where could music fit for me? When mm -hmm. I went into the house, it was winter time. I had on my coat, my guitar on my back, and you know a bag full of stuff. And I went in, and he was in a hospital bed in the living room, and he was vomiting blood from his lungs. I had never seen that before. And as a therapist, as a woman, you go, <gasps> okay, you set that aside. I'll deal with that later. Let me yeah. be of purpose. And so I started to just hum to the rapid rate of his breath. And, and of course, he didn't know me from Adam. But because rhythm is so basic in the human condition, he started to recognize what I was doing. And then I started to slow down. And he started to slow down. He wow. started to bring his respiration rate down, which is the relaxation response. Rapid breathing is the stress response. So I started to bring that down there. Um, and again, I've still got my coat on and the guitar, you know, the work is so immediate. Yeah. Eventually there was no time I to got, waste. yeah, it was a hundred degrees in there. And eventually I get all this stuff off and I started to bring in some music and I started uh, lulling accompaniment to gentle improvisation that was continuing to drive the relaxation response. And then I took his hands in mine. And I sang, you'll never walk alone again. And I sang it really quietly because when you're quiet, people have to listen to you. And then he went to sleep. And his wife said, oh, God, I can't believe he went to sleep. I never would have guessed that he could go. Oh, my God, thank you. So now the lens was turned on. Darling, show me some pictures of your husband. Of your husband. Yeah. Oh, you know the way I can't see him right now. And so I could see her shoulders go down. And she showed me some pictures. And she said, you know, he loved music. I can't believe I forgot music. I can't believe I forgot music. And your children are coming to say goodbye. I'll be sure to have music. And so I said, well, what music did he like? And she said, he used to play guitar. And he loved Glenn Campbell. And he loved, I forget who else he said, but I just learned this lovely, lovely tune that Glenn had written with dementia. And I sang that to her. Um, and it really was about um, a better place. It's 
had a better place. Um, I'm headed to a better place. And that how important it was to be helpful, to be supportive. And I blessed her and I left. And, you know, I mean, I feel tears now. And yeah. it's just some of the most beautiful <clears throat> and sacred moments of my life. And that's what wow. music allows us to take three strangers, you know, um, yeah. and make them intimate partners in what really matters. In wow. That is so true. And that took so much courage on your part. Thank goodness there are people like you. I think so many of us would fear going in there. You felt where you were needed and you really brought them something. That was, I'm sure um, it's a story you both tell. I can't imagine like walking in as a speech therapist. I can't imagine walking in as a friend and knowing what to do. But if everybody has a proper music education, yeah, they'll think to bring music to those moments because it really yeah it's bringing us to our humanity that's we get so disconnected from each other and from our spirit or whatever you want to call that and and music brings us right there that's so beautiful thank you for sharing that story I, um, i'll never forget it it's taken a long time to integrate that sacredness you know into sort of my everyday world I mean you go back after a moment like that to cleaning toilets and dusting furniture and, right and, you know Nothing all matters I well lived yeah yeah wow I think that's so inspiring I think someone will hear that story and want to become a music therapist I think it's very hard to just teach and not do the work anymore um, because the work really feeds you. Um, mm -hmm. as, as you give of yourself, um, you get so much. And I have a beloved friend, Lori Kubitschek at Mass General Hospital, who has been working in pediatric oncology for decades. Oh, when she yeah. was about 30, she had already been working a long time because she worked at the Hole in the Wall camp that Paul Newman has for cancer uh, children when she was a teenager, mm. she was about 30 and she lost a little girl that it just broke her. And she thought about not being a music therapist anymore. But then she said, each time my heart breaks, I want it to break open to love bigger, the next child who comes into my life. And I think that aptly describes a really healthy um, music therapist. And Lori is beyond healthy. She's just an incredible spirit in this world, um, an incredibly evolved human that brings this in music to children who are afraid and parents who are even more afraid. Yeah. So <clears throat> as we're going through the hour, I want to make sure that we cover things that you want to talk about. Things that I would enjoy talking about would be mental health because okay. of COVID and the exacerbation of those that were already vulnerable. Um, there were three students this past semester that I had to ask in one week, are you in danger of harming yourself? Wow. They, the students in of this generation, this generation of young people are notably more fragile than any generation I've ever taught, without a doubt. And wow. in general, people are more fragile. Again, we have these ancient brains that have not evolved to live with so many dynamics of global warming, social injustice. Um, you know, it, it goes on and on. And these are the environmental pressures that we have to succeed in, or we won't, like any mm -hmm. other time. So I would ask people to consider making affective playlists. Most of our playlists are organized by genre, by artists, but if you make an affective playlist, um, what is it that can help you transition emotionally? So I have one for kitchen dancing. I have one for waking to a beautiful world because I am not a morning person. 
I will never be a morning person. And, and I would have to take a train at 6.20 in the morning, meaning I got up at five something. Um, I used music so that when I arrived in Boston, that I would have something that would start me walking kind of slowly because that's where I was, but then pick me up because there was no, I would start meeting the students at like um, 7.30 in the morning. Um, I would take them to coffee and, and sit and listen. And I was always going to be bright as a button. Well, that doesn't happen naturally for me. The music <laughs> always helped. So if yeah. we take that one step further and think about if you're down or depressed, what is the music that meets you on the couch? And then what is the next piece that has you sit up? And then what is the next piece that has you get up and rejoin the, the stream of your life? Force? That's How a is great it that idea. Use music to meet where you are. But if mm -hmm. you're mad, if you're angry, well, get out that music. Get out yeah. a drum. Drum is really the only thing on the planet, not animals, not people, that can take anger. A drum can. Pretty soon your hand is going to hurt and you're going to find yourself in a nice gentle group. But get the anger out. Stomp, stomp, stomp your anger out. And then help find that next piece of music that's going to make you feel more neutral. Mm -hmm. But honor the anger, get it out. Honor the depression, meet it and then start to drive the change. But I think we should be looking at affective playlists. Like what song do you have, Lindsay, that makes you feel strong when you're vulnerable? Hmm, that's a good question. I think of, I think, yeah. I think that, that, <clears throat> that song, um, This Girl Is On Fire. Do you know that song? Yeah, yeah. that was when I listened to yeah mm -hmm. but yeah those kinds of things can lift us up um and yeah to be conscious of it and i think that we have a tendency probably to say i'm sad i'm going to listen to sad music and just kind of then sink into that but not to think of what how, that you can actually help yourself out of it consciously um and embracing where you're at but then knowing that you're going to transition out of that that is such just, a good idea you're nudging the needle. you know you're just nudging that needle from sad to glad from yes. mad to glad or neutral you know but you can nudge the needle yeah and that we are all going to to ride the waves of emotions all of the emotions and that music can take us through any of them there was another point in your talk where you said, would you go to a gym if they weren't playing music? And that <laughs> that makes me think of this because it it's a partner in experiencing the emotion with you. It, it kind of uh, stimulates or provokes emotion and then also enhances it. it. It releases it. So if you want to feel sad, you know you need to cry. You can make yourself cry by listening to a certain music. Um, and the same thing goes for trying to lift yourself up. I love that idea. Um, yeah, music is a temporal art. Again, you can sh make things shift across time. What is, the, what is your music living will? What music would you want to have playing if you can't speak for yourself? Mm -hmm. What music do you want to, to identify as something that can reach you across the divide of pathology? If you were in a state of unconsciousness, I always joke that as a saxophonist, you know, a nurse may want to bring bring me music and go, oh, I have this Kenny G album. Well, as it turns out, I dislike Kenny G's music a lot. He's a fine musician. It's yeah. not that. I just don't like it. But I would uh, <laughs> want to hear Ben Webster, Jerry Mulligan, and my husband, but not the stuff he recorded with his ex-girlfriend, right? We all have very defined taste in music. I know that you could reach me with Pavarotti and Johnny Hodges and Ben Webster. I would be like this. I would pull yeah. out of wherever I was, particularly if you turned it off and said to me, do you want more? In that expectancy violation, I would generate the best 
possible response that I could give my biological mother. And you could tell how much online I was because of that. Hmm. Well, this is so fascinating. And uh, you have also created the website Music Therapy Tales. Uh, so you're the founder of that website, musictherapytales.com. People can go to that. And what can they find there? You will see uh, patients, um, clients, and therapists um, talking about their stories in music therapy, as I did with mine in hospice, so that you give a better sense. It's an advocacy for music therapy so that you can understand how to count on it in your life. So it's divided into groups like Parkinson's disease or dementia or autism, where these stories are told. There will be more uh, uh, books to accompany these um, forthcoming. Um, they're spilling out of my head as we speak. And <laughs> uh, so it is an opportunity to better understand this most beloved Wonderful. And people can also find you at KathleenHowland.com, which is your own personal website where you have your blog and you share your thoughts. Uh, I really enjoyed reading reading what you have to say on all sorts of different subjects. You cover social justice issues, COVID, uh, neuroscience. So if anyone connects with Kathleen um, here on this podcast or video, and wants to see and hear more, go to that website and you can follow her there. Thank you. Um, do you have anything else that you feel like you didn't get out? <laughs> I think the that music therapy's great gift to the world is the ability to address issues from womb to tomb, whether they're related to disabilities or deficits or really strengthening potential and abilities that uh, there was an African scholar that came to Berkeley and I was peppering him with questions. Um, and one of the things that he shared with me is that women all begin to sing to their babies when they learn they're pregnant. It's just a convention. And now of course, through science, we know that that baby is listening in the last trimester and it helps wire their brain um, in yeah. powerful ways. But I, <laughs> would love to see us move back to these indigenous ways of being yes. together in music. Um, I'm yes. reading Victor Me too. Putin's wonderful book, um, The Spirit of Music, where he talks about mother music is dying because what we oh. had done in the, oh, it's, it's a beautiful, the first 10 pages have just grabbed me, but that we as peoples thrived in the caves, presumably, I believe that strongly. Um, and came together and always made music together. But now we're going into this digitization, slices of an authentic instrument, slices of authentic music making, and we're bubbled in individual pods. And mother music mm. is dying. And so mm. I would suggest to people not only to bring your music into your life digitally, yes, but go out and experience it live. Go out. I used to love being at a music college when when I was a student because I'd say, oh, tonight there's a trombone recital. I had no idea what a trombone player would play in a recital. Let's go check it out. You know, yeah. I explored and expanded my love of music um, to being around the world by being open and curious. And I think those are great lessons from education is to be open and curious and um, to bring music into your life to go out and, and, and support musicians. I'm getting ready to build a patio so I can hire some out of work musicians to play in my backyard behind me as senior housing. And yes. it's like, oh, okay, well, this is a win-win. Let's just get somebody here and get them all out in their chairs, socially distant still, and let's create some joy. Let's be neighbors. Let the music bind us once again. So in any way that you can to get out and laud musicians, as very important members of society and not yeah. keep them some low place on the pedestal. It's undeserved in any way that I've ever looked at. Yes. It reminded me, I wanted to read you a quote 
uh, from this book, which I don't know if you've heard of, The Brain Rules for Baby. I read this when I was pregnant, and we were speaking of infants uh, before they're born, hearing their mother and what's going on around them. It says, babies remember. It says, it just jumped out at me. Brat exclaimed to his mother, Brat had been at the podium of a symphony orchestra conducting a piece of music for the first time when the cellist began to play. He instantly knew he'd heard this piece before. This is no casual reminder of some similar but forgotten work. Brock could predict exactly what musical phrase was coming next. He could anticipate the flow of the entire work during the course of the rehearsal. He knew how to conduct it even when he lost his place in the score. Freaking out, he called his mother a professional cellist. She asked for the name of the piece, piece of music, then burst out laughing. It was the piece she had been rehearsing when she was pregnant with him. The cello was up against her late pregnancy mid-abdomen, a structure filled with sound-conducting fluids fully capable of relaying musical information to her unborn son. His developing brain was sensitive enough to record the musical memories. All the scores I knew by sight were the ones she had played while she was pregnant with me. Brought later said in an interview, incredible stuff for an organ not even zero years old. So. So true. And... You know, it's not easy to do research on fetuses, um, but there has been a great deal that's been done, and they hear very nicely inside. And had that son not developed his musicianship, I doubt very much he would still have access to those memories. Yeah. But his own musicianship and the continued life he led that was rich in music allowed him to make that beautiful piece. Amazing. 